Turn to Galatians 5. That's where we'll start. Thank you, Lord, that we can be here tonight. And um, Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for our health. And uh, Lord, thank you that we know thee. And uh, Lord, we can meet freely. We have a Bible, Lord. We've got multiple Bibles. Um, Lord, all of us in this room, we have been blessed with much truth and much encouragement along the way. And uh, Lord, help us again tonight. Uh, Lord, may the value of this truth, uh, Lord, tonight, may it be evident. And um, Lord, may it, may it make a huge difference presently and in the years to come and in the families to come, Lord, should you tarry. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we started um, last week, uh, we started talking about things that you want to teach your daughters. And that's, um, that's where we, uh, we started. We got a couple of things in on that. So I, where, where I want to continue with that thought tonight. One of the things I want to start off with is, um, you know, we need to teach our daughters to do away with a competitive spirit. Um, actually, I, you know, a lot of these things will apply to men and women. In fact, one of the one of the examples, one of the Bible examples we're going to use was actually between two men. OK, but um, uh, you're right there in Galatians five and look at verse 19. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Um, verse 17, it says the flesh lusteth against the spirit and spirit against the flesh. Verse 16 says walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the flesh, that's that old nature. That's that old sinful part of us that, um, uh, you know, it's got, you know, even even though we want to do right and we love the Lord uh, at times, there's things that rise up. And of course, you see in these verses that um, uh, the flesh is a, sort of a multifaceted monster like um, it. It shows up at different in different ways uh, and in different people in different ways and at different times in their life. And it's the enemy of the spirit of God. Um uh, the enemy of God the Father is the world. The enemy of God the Son is Satan. The enemy of the Spirit of God is our flesh. And um, um, you see this list. And in this list, there's a few words there. I, I, years ago, I heard a guy who was preaching on this, and he said, I used to read that and think, man, I'm not guilty of any of that. And then he realized, he said, I don't even know what those words mean. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, when I say do away with competitive spirit, um, there is a word in this list. Actually, there's there's four that in one way or another is sort of include this thought, but there is one word primarily. The four words are variance, emulations, strife, sedition. In one way or another, those words have to do with strife or contest. But the word emulations by dictionary definition means strife. It means, and I quote, competition, rivalry accompanied with a desire to put down someone else. So the word emulations implies a, a, a competitive thing. You know, uh, Christianity is, it, we're, we're not in a competition with each other. Um, um, and usually, um, you know, people aren't usually competing for the most Bible reading or the most time in prayer. In fact, you know, people don't really talk about that much. Usually it, it has to do with, you know, the limelight or attention or recognition or favor or whatever. Um, competition. You know, uh, we, we are in a competition, but it, it is a race. Uh, and, and our race is against time. 
It's not against each other. You know, uh, you know, I'm not trying to out to do somebody else and you're not trying to out do me. In fact, when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, God's not going to ask you, well, well, he's not going to say, Brett, why didn't you do as good as Bob? You know, isn't that awful when somebody in the family says, Alex, you should be like Riley. You know, isn't it awful when, when, when parents or spouses, it's just a dumb thing to do. Well, if you were like so and so's husband, oh, if you were like if you were like so and so's wife, um, you know, uh, our our competition is is that's not that doesn't even enter into it. Um, but Paul, but Paul said, "I have finished my course." There's a race that we've got in front of us, and and uh, it's it's a race not against each other. But it's a race to finish what God has to do in the time that we have left. Um, look at some verses with me. Look at 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. Real familiar verse. Years ago, I heard a lady say this, and I, I just read it again uh, from another source. And um, and the reason I say we need to teach our, our young ladies this, even, even though, there again, some of these truths overlap, and um, and some of these truths, well, you'll, you'll see them pop up when we start addressing the young men. There is some overlap with some of these truths, because a lot of these truths really just deal with human nature. But... But there is some things that men really have a weakness towards. And there's some things that ladies really have a weakness towards. And um, years ago, uh, a lady said to me, she said, women naturally view other women as competition. Now, of course, that's taking the spirit of God out of the equation. Okay. But uh, it, it, is, it is a very natural thing. Um, you know, they just feel this. Uh, and, and you know that you you'll see it. Um, you get this this um, you'll know what I mean. This caddy thing going on, and there's just some some women not, but there's some when they throw off this this vibe, and it's just it's just um, they think they're better or they want to be better or they got to be better than you, and they're always throwing jabs. That's that competitive spirit. Okay. Um, Look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Um, look at 3 John. If you, if you hit the book of Revelation and just back up, you'll see the one, that little tiny book, Jude, and you back up one more page and you'll see 3 John. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Uh, let me give an example. And thank God, you know, as far as I know, I don't, I don't see any of this here. And, I, and I'm thankful for that. Um, I remember, okay, I'm, I'm jumping the track here. So, um, Abby, I'm going to have you remind me about the girls in New Jersey, okay? And if I can remember where I was going to go here. The, uh, we had an evangelist come to our church in Saskatchewan, and he was an old guy. Um, he was about 70 then. It's looking younger all the time. But he was about 70 then. And um, he, uh, he told me uh, after a few days of being in our church there, he said, Brother Newman, he said, you know, he said, um, he said I've been looking for, for clicks around here. And he said, by the grace of God, he said, I, I don't think I see any. He said, but it is very common. And it's very common in churches. Okay, Abby, I remember. Um, the um, We know a young couple 
and they they started a church in Saskatchewan. Um, they go to, uh, or she is from a fairly large, well-known church in the state of New Jersey. And if I mentioned, uh, I could drop a couple names of some singing groups that come out of that area, and some of you listen to some of their music. She said um, when she was there, she said at that church, um, and this particular girl that, that I'm talking about, she's, uh, she's quite attractive. And she said in that church, she said there was a group of girls that were really very attractive. And she said, if you, if you weren't pretty, she said, you were nobody. Now, we're not talking about secular university. We're talking about in the church house. She said, literally. She said, she said, now I, this girl was telling me, she said, I was, I was trying to be a Christian. And she said, I was nice to everybody. And this group of pretty girls was giving me a hard time. And we're not talking about six-year-olds. We're talking about 18, 19. And they were, they were giving her a hard time for hanging out with the not so pretty girls. See, that's the competitive spirit. Okay. And we need to teach our daughters that that is heinous and it's ugly and it's hurtful and they need to avoid it like the plague. Okay. Look at, um, look at third John one verse nine. John says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes who loveth to have the preeminence among them receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us. In other words, saying hateful things against us with malicious words and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. Diotrephes was a man in this particular church that John is referring to. And um, he was going to be the top dog and he was going to control everything that went on. And he was not going to allow anybody to threaten him. So there again, you see that competitive thing going on. A, a, a real classic example of it in the Bible is Saul and David. You remember, uh, David kills Goliath and all Israel rejoices and rightfully so. And David's just a young guy. David has, David has no interest in, you know, he, he's not trying to give anybody any grief. He's not trying to pull strings and manipulate and, and, and climb the ladder and be a big shot. He just he just killed Goliath. You know, he just saw something needed done, and he did it. And um, everybody's happy. Saul is happy, but only for a little while. Because Saul takes David and puts him in charge of his soldiers, makes him the captain of his army. And the next thing you know, the ladies are singing in the streets. Saul has killed his thousands, and David his... Ten thousands. Oh, my. And um, Saul, from that day on, he saw David as a threat. Was David a threat? No. David went out of his way all his life to honor Saul. David could have killed Saul on a few occasions, but he never did. Even when the opportunity was laid right in front of him. David said to Saul on two or three occasions, why are you chasing me, Saul? He said, he said, you're coming out after me. He said, I'm a dead dog. I'm a flea. In other words, I am no threat to you. But Saul could never get that out of his head. He saw David as a competitor for the throne. Um, we need to do away with competitive spirit. We need to teach our daughters that they can relax and be themselves and not to feel threatened, not to feel threatened. Um, when we first were in uh, Northern Ontario, um, we were in our thirties and there, in the church, that little Northern church we attended, there was actually a lot of young couples. And, um, and so, you know, we, we made friends and it, and it was great, you know? And, um, and one of the ladies that uh, was there, uh, went to the store with Mitzi one day. And so they're, they're both about 30. And um, and this lady is following my wife through the store. And my wife would 
pull this off the shelf. And the lady would go, oh, no, 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 you don't want that. You want this. And she's like, okay. She, you know, and she'd go to Grant. No, 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 you don't want that. You want this. And um, and you know what? She absolutely, and, and of course she wasn't just like this with my wife. She was like this with everybody. And that's why she didn't have any friends. She couldn't let somebody else be themselves because somehow she felt threatened by that. You know what would have helped her is if when she was about this high and, and as she grew that her mom took every opportunity to get that out of her head. She would have thanked her mom, but her mom never did that. Don't feel threatened. You can relax and be yourself and um, and you can let others be themselves if you if you don't have that competitive spirit. Um, let me give you another one that we need to teach our daughters. And that is um, we need to teach them uh, what to look for in a man. We need to teach them that. You'd be amazed, and, and of course, some of you ladies, I bet I could get testimonies tonight, and um, some of you that are married, um, you know you know how a, a lot of ladies were just, they grew up and they got married, and they were never taught anything. Like, they, they just weren't taught anything. They just sort of grew up by the seat of their pants, and, you know, as long as they weren't, you know, um, you know, shoplifting, or doing something really terrible, you know, that embarrassed their mom. Um, they just, you know, as long as they were semi-nice and didn't cause a lot of grief, you know, they just they just grew up. And, and you know what it is? It, it, they sort of grew up. Um, they, they just really grew up on their own. And the problem is that that happens in our churches with our kids. And that shouldn't be. Um you know, our our daughters and some of you young ladies, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna, this this guy's gonna come into their life, mm -hmm. and um, you know what? He's gonna be, you know, handsome and nice and um, charming, and uh, and and she's gonna fall hook line and sinker, and um, and of course, you know, you you know he'll he'll be a Christian. He'll he'll tell you he is, and um, and you're just gonna you're just gonna hope for the best. And you know as well as I do, a lot of those things wind in disaster in our churches. Um, what should they look for in a man? What should they look for? Well, um, they should look for a man that is not impulsive. Not impulsive. You know, not not one 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 minute it's it's this, and then the next minute it's this, and and um, uh, man, he's all over the map. Um, you know, there's some things that um, seem cute. You know, especially when when she's starry eyed, and 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 he's he's just lavishing her with attention. And and there's these there's these dumb red flags, but. But she's just giddy with romance and she doesn't understand that some of these things will not be cute someday. Um, uh, she needs to make sure he's not a hothead. Um, you know, um, she needs to watch how he treats his siblings. She needs to know how, you know, you know um, um, how you treat your siblings is often an indicator of how they will treat people they get used to as life progresses. You know, who are your siblings? Well, that's the people you grow up in your house and you're, 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 you get used to them and you, you love them, you know, you love them. But, um, but man, you can, you can be pretty nasty with your siblings and they can be pretty nasty towards you. Um, you know, not selfish. Um, does, does he have some self-control? Does he have self-control? And you say, well, 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 pastor, how in the world are we supposed to know that? Oh, that's really simple. 
That's really simple. Number one, you're not in a hurry. Now, when I say that, people go, oh, no, 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 I, I, don't, I don't mean it's got to take three or four years. I, I don't mean that at all. But you don't, you don't, you're not in a hurry. And number two, you're talking to God. And you're saying, God, I know this guy is the cat's meow right now. And, and, and I really like him. But Lord, I also know he's putting his best foot forward just like I am. And Lord, I need to know who he really is. And then, and then you begin to look for ways. Uh, and there are ways. And God, you know what God, um, in the book of Daniel, on several, several points, God is, several places in the book, God is called the revealer of secrets. The revealer of secrets. Um, you want to you want to know you want to know who this guy is. Um, you you've got to you know if, if he's a zillion miles away and you're just you're just writing letters back and forth, or if you only if you only see this guy once in a while, man oh man oh man, uh, you know there there's there's benefits to that you know and since there maybe there's no physical con- temptation because you're never together, but boy the other side of that is. Um, how, how do you really get to know? And you say, you say, oh, well, that's easy. I'll just, I'll just talk to his pastor. I'll just. Are you sure? Um, one of the first guys that approached us about our daughter, Elizabeth. One of the first guys. Um, I called his pastor. And I said, tell me about so-and-so. And you know what he did? And, and he's a good guy. He's, he was, he's a good pastor. But you know, honestly, he really didn't know the guy either. Although he was a member of an outstanding family in his church that had been there for a long time. Uh, and you know what he did? He said, oh, he's a great guy and, and this and that. And he gave me this high recommendation. Well, they started seeing each other, and um, the months began to unfold. And we were praying, and she was praying. Now, Lord, I really want to know who he is. And when the real person emerged, she came back to our bedroom one night. And she said, Dad, Mom, can I talk to you? And we said, sure. And she said, Dad, Mom, this and this and this and this and this. And I said, okay, so what do you do now? She said, I know what I need to do. I mean, she had this big honking ring. I mean, he bought her a really nice diamond ring. Uh, They were engaged. Marriage was, we had already bought stuff for the wedding. But the real person emerged. You see, the pastor said he's a great guy. You know how much that guarantees? Nothing, unless the pastor knows him like the back of his hand. You know, you you need to teach your daughters to enter into these things with great wariness. The highway of Christianity is littered with women that got sucker punched. There was another young girl that we know fairly well. And um, she was at Bible school and and uh, this this guy was there and he was been there for a while. And and uh, he um, they start seeing each other and and the dad said, you know, he said he talked to the pastor, which was a good thing to do. And the pastor was really wise. And he and he said, pastor, he said. I don't know about this guy. Said he, he's a really nice guy. Obviously, he's in Bible school. You know, he's got his, all his P's and Q's and his I's dotted and his T's crossed. And, and you know, he knows the right clothes to wear to church and the right way to act. And he probably goes on visitation. He does all the right things. Oh, you can get sucker punched. He said, does all the right things. But he said, I just, he said, how do I, how do I know 
He said, I need some way to find out some information. He said, I just don't know enough about this guy to be comfortable. And the preacher said, man, I don't know. He said, let me make a few phone calls. So the pastor called the preacher, got a glowing recommendation. So then the pastor thought, I'm going to call the dormitory supervisor. In the, in the dormitory where the, where, the, where the young guy was there. And he said, he called him up and, the, and he gets on the phone with the dormitory supervisor, tells him who he is. He says, you know, you know, so-and-so. And the dorm supervisor said, oh, yeah, I know so-and-so. And he said, um, he said, uh, you know, we got to, you know, he's interested in so-and-so. And, and of course, the guy knew the, the, the girl. And he said, she goes to our church. And he said, he said, he wants to pursue this thing. And, and he said, uh, what can you tell me about him? And he said, and so the guy starts running down that, you know, they don't want to say anything negative. Oh, you know, he's a great guy, and this and that and the other. And the preacher goes, okay. In, in his mind, he's thinking, okay, I'm getting nowhere. And then all of a sudden he said, would you, um, would you let him marry your daughter? And there was this pregnant pause. <laughs> and he said, okay. He said, tell me why you wouldn't want him with your daughter. And he spilled the beans. But if he hadn't asked that question, he'd never known. Um, pay attention. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. You need to, I, I know guys, I know, I know, I know there's extremes. And I know there's control freaks. And man, I've seen that. And I, and we hate that. And so we're gonna we're we we're gonna allow that statement, we're gonna set that aside. Okay, so barring that, you need to have a relationship with your daughter, and you need to teach your daughters to have some confidence in you that you love them and you're not gonna try to make them, you know, a um, a celibate woman until she's 50, you know, you're, you're willing to let her be married. And when the right guy comes along, you'll help her on her way. She needs to understand that you're not being a fruit loop and you're not trying to control her, but she needs to have some confidence in you. And you know what? You know what? She needs to trust you. She needs to trust your walk with God. Do you have one? I told the story. I think I told it not long ago, so I'm going to tell the story. I'm going to shut her down for tonight. This family traveled around and would sing, and uh, they were great. I mean, they were a blessing. Loved to hear them sing. And uh, their kids were all, you know, and, and they're, the, oldest, the oldest kid in the bunch was in his early 20s. And uh, so in their travels, they met this preacher's daughter, you know, and, and him and her started seeing each other, you know, and and um, uh, and so the guy falls in love, and and um, and and it's really getting serious. And so around Christmas time, the guy invited the girl to spend Christmas with him and their family, and it was well supervised. You know, nothing. They weren't letting them go off. You know, and all that. So it was well supervised. The two weeks came and went, and there was no incident. Like, there, there was no explosive episode. There was no devious episode. They didn't ca catch her doing something dark, you know, nothing like that. But, but the mom and the dad, at the end of that two weeks, they felt uncomfortable, and they didn't even know why. There was just something. Oh, you need to pay attention to that something. And... um. They looked at the son and they said, son, they said, uh, wow. I said, you know what? She's a nice girl. We don't feel, you know, I don't, we just, oh, we don't know what it is, but we feel like you need to give this some time. We just, we just don't feel comfortable with this. And the son said, well, why? And they said, we don't even know. They said, but there's something not, we just don't feel good about this. Can, can you give this some more time? And he said, no. He said, we, we want to get married the next, you know, two or three months, whatever it was. And they said, okay. They didn't feel like they could, if, if they had really insisted, maybe, but they just, because they didn't have a good reason, they just thought, oh, well, we, we can't do this. So they let him get married. You know what happened? 
on, on their honeymoon night. I mean, they just got married. They go to the motel. They walk in the motel room and she looks at him and says, now you need to know something. She goes, I don't love you. And I never did. But she said, but me and a bunch of girls had a bet on that I could get you to marry me. And she said, I have won the bet. Can I tell you girls something? He was a big, strapping, good-looking guy. You know, in, any girl would have thought, wow, what a prize. That's not what she was about. For the next year, he washed the dishes. He washed the clothes. He made the meals. He did everything under God's heaven to try to keep her and win her. And at the end of a year, she walked. You know what would have saved the day? If he would have listened when his parents said, we don't feel good about this. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts and our, our, our daughters and our sons, and, you know, in this case, it was a son. Um, we, we need to teach them these things. And in so doing, we will save them from great heartache. Got a little box of celestial seasons tea one time. And on the back, it said 10, 10 rules for life. And it was, you know, for the most part, it was a bunch of new age baloney. But all of a sudden, I got to uh, one of the last rules for life, and here's what it said. Celestial seasonings. The children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of life. It said, choose your life's mate carefully. For from this one decision will come 90% of your future happiness or misery. We need to teach our, our sons and our daughters what to look for. And we must teach them to trust us. And they've got to have some confidence in our walk with God and in the compassion of our own heart that they'll know we're not just trying to be a control freak. We're trying to save them from disaster. We must teach them this. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, simple truth. Blessed, O oh God, we pray. Lord, I pray that every young person in this room would marry well. And uh, Lord, that their marriage would be just always a blessed gift from Thee. And, but Lord, help us and help them because the day is going to come if you tarry when they will have sons and daughters and they must teach them. Lord, help us. Lord. Help us to do away with that competitive spirit. And Lord, help us. May they take it to heart what they need to look for in a man or a woman. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you, give you just, just a minute to talk to the Lord.
Lord, help us this week. Keep us safe as we go home. And uh, Lord, help us to be ready. Lord, help us to be ready for tomorrow. But Lord, help us to be ready for Sunday. Lord, help us to be much in prayer for each other. And, uh, and God, about the things that were mentioned tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.